Okay, volcanic hazards. In volcanic hazards, these are the things that kill or destroy during a volcanic eruption. We'll be discussing lava flows today, uh, pyroclastic flows, which are the billowing clouds of hot ash, gas, and air, the mud flows, which are called lahars, it's the Indonesian word for mud flow. Essentially, these are the volcanic materials mixing with the snow caps or even sometimes rainstorms, uh, producing bad flows of mud and landslides that bury and destroy. There are also poisonous gas flows that come from the ground. The gas is uh, seeping away from the magma, building up and then uh, letting loose down uh, mountain sides uh, and being very dangerous. We'll talk about those. Tsunamis, water flows, I suppose, are uh, prevalent in volcanic eruptions, especially on some of the islands that pyroclastic flows can hit the water. Uh, you can have the island itself blow up and produce a tsunami. Tephra, which is uh, the fallout of the smallest of the debris from the volcanic eruption, which can cause issues with the climate and the atmosphere around, and also gases that are emitted from the volcano. So let's let's go. Let's discuss this here. Uh, throughout our presentation, we're going to cover uh, most of the biggest eruptions that we've seen in the last 500 years. Uh, together, these have killed almost 300,000 people, noting here that uh, there's been eruptions in Iceland, in Japan, in Indonesia, um, Nevada del Riz is in Colombia, Mount Pele in the Caribbean, so all over the world, the places that we see these volcanic arcs and these island arcs, this is where we see a lot of these deadly eruptions. And then Iceland, we have the divergent boundary producing some problems now and then. And this is kind of a visual showing all the different things uh, that happen during a volcanic eruption and all the associated hazards that come with it. We can see the pyroclastic cloud, pyroclastic flows, the ash fall, actually producing kind of a muddy rain, an acidy rain, gas release, uh, et cetera. So we'll start with lava flows. These aren't big killers, but they certainly cause lots of damage uh, and can be very costly. Um, typically with Icelandic and Hawaiian eruptions, you have pretty runny magma, consistency of maybe uh, warm honey on some, some occasions, uh, flowing at uh, sometimes walking speed, usually and even faster in some cases, usually non-explosive, like I said, but very steady. Uh, Iceland, of course, is one example. Jaime Iceland on the southern coast there is a, a big fishing port, and um, it erupted in 1973, uh, Iceland erupted in a fissure near Jaime in 1973, and it really uh, increased the size of the island by 20%, filled in an important fishing harbor, uh, which uh, was devastating um, and difficult. So uh, not without its share of problems here. But here it is, here's Jaime and the town overlooking. You can see the lava flows that came in and hemmed in on different sides of the, the town. Uh, a rare uh, lava flow uh, killed several refugees. Um, during a Rwandan civil war, there was uh, many uh, refugees in Zaire, and they were on the mountainside of this volcano, and it erupted, and there was a really fast lava flow. Uh, because there were so many people near, half a million people, it killed 45 people. Um, so very rare instance, but nonetheless uh, dangerous. Pyroclastic flows are these super hot, high speed, turbulent clouds of ash, rocks, and gas. Uh, these things, of course, can kill thousands of people in one event. The case of Pompeii buried the entire city. Uh, these are some of the biggest killers you would see directly from a volcanic eruption. The majority of deaths in the Mount St. Helens eruption were from pyroclastic flows as well. 
70%, in fact, of all deaths from volcanoes occur from these pyroclastic flows. Uh, they come and entomb the town in this burning hot ash, and it's really difficult to escape. Um, here's one from a eruption in Guatemala in 2018, uh, the remnants of it, to give you an idea of what it's like. Pyroclastic flows can travel over 400 miles per hour. Here's an infamous picture uh, of the pyroclastic flows coming from Mount Pinatubo in 1991 uh, with a uh, vehicle trying to outrun them. Uh, depending on how fast the pyroclastic flow is, it can really overtake and kill you even in the fastest of vehicles. Not only do they knock down anything in their path, but they burn everything through as well. Um, here's a remnant of a pyroclastic flow from Sumatra in 2006. And here's a picture of a pyroclastic flow coming down Mount Unzen in Japan in 1991. Let's see if we can get this playing here. Uh-oh. Guess not. Uh, nonetheless, Nonetheless, uh, deadly eruption. Mount Pele, which is in the island of Martinique, in 1902 erupted. Um, it killed over 30,000 people when it erupted right here at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, and most of them, of course, died from the pyroclastic flow from the major eruption. It went down like this. On April 23rd, uh, a small pyroclastic flow killed about 40 people and raised tension in the area. Um, but there is an election coming up. So the, the mayor of St. Pierre said, no, no, we don't have to worry. In fact, the militia was used in some cases to prevent people from leaving. And on May 8th, then, a pyroclastic flow enveloped the town and killed all but two residents. It's uh, reported. It said that they were in a jail. but. I don't know the details of that. Uh, this is uh, Martinique here today, the town of St. Pierre, rebuilt after the major eruption. Uh, beautiful uh, place, right? Uh, but Mount Pele, you can see these uh, kind of side vents here from the mountain erupting at different times in the past. Obviously an active volcano, so St. Pierre isn't the safest when it comes to uh, living places. No place is really when you're living on a volcano. Uh, lahars or mud flows uh, are the mix of the loose, unconsolidated tephra on the slopes when mixing with the water from snow caps or from uh, rainfall, even crater lakes. Here's a picture of a mud flow from Soufre Hills in Montserrat from 1995. Uh, again, another Caribbean volcano. As you can see, it goes down the low places, particularly the river valleys, and anything near it, it uh, just basically can kind of bury. And of course, there's been several infamous examples of mud flows burying towns from volcanic eruptions. Uh, you can see a lahar pictured here from Mount St. Helens in 1982. <clears throat> They're very fast. Uh, they move along existing stream valleys and can and accompany eruptions. Uh, or occur even many years after, because when uh, things mix with the volcanic debris, they can certainly produce these mud flows. You can be uh, kind of muddy water, anywhere from muddy water to wet concrete in a consistency with a lahar. And they can just basically plow through anything, bridges, highways, houses, even whole towns. Here's a picture uh, from the lahar in Indonesia in 1982 from Galunggung. And you can see just uh, south of Jakarta there, uh, the mud flows got so deep that they completely buried uh, these houses. And of course, there's an infinite, um, I'm sorry, a uh, infamous example of Nevada del Ruiz from 1985. This was in November of that year. And the town of Armero got completely buried 
You can see uh, the before and after picture here in the upper right, uh, noting that here's our marrow before, and then here's our marrow afterward. Uh, pretty crazy. Um, it was a really bad humanitarian disaster. Uh, it killed 23,000 of the 27,000 residents. Uh, aid workers came in and tried to get people uh, out of the mud buried in. Um, the people that survived were lucky because uh, that was it could have killed everyone. And of course, Mount, Rain Mount Rainier is a threat for Lahars. It's really high. It's got extensive glacial caps. Uh, it's got frequent earthquakes and active hot water springs, noting that the magma is near the surface there. Not only threatening an eruption, but the lahars that would ensue afterward would be pretty devastating. You can see Mount Rainier there looming like a monster behind Tacoma, Washington, from the Puget Sound in the bottom left there. The bottom right, you can see uh, Mount Rainier from Seattle, even pretty close to uh, large populated areas. In fact, there's some towns uh, that have built on top of the ancient mud flows from Mount Rainier. Fording, Washington, for example, uh, has volcano drills with their students uh, where they get into buses and go to higher ground because they know if, if the volcano erupts, they're going to get buried. So you can see the Osceola mud flow from a uh, previous eruption from Mount Rainier went down the mountainsides and spilled out over the Puget Sound lowland. Several towns, Endemclaw, Buckley, and Ording, Washington here. Um, in the wake of this. Poisonous gas, another hazard here. What happens is magma intrudes up on a volcano and it's charged with poisonous gases. And for us, carbon dioxide is a poisonous gas. So oftentimes carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, it'll enter the crater lakes um, or the areas around the, the, the top part of the volcano, the crater lakes will absorb that CO2, but it builds up in the water, so much so that you can actually, the water will actually belch out all the, the gases that have collected towards the bottom of the volcano. And what it does is it overturns and the CO2 is released. CO2 is more dense than the nitrogen and oxygens in the air. And so what it'll do is it'll start wafting silently down the mountainside, invisible, and one moment you're alive, the next moment you pass out and you're dead. Uh, so it's a silent but deadly killer. Poisonous gas from the volcano. There are some crater lakes in the west part of Africa here uh, where uh, active uh, magma is coming uh, close to the surface and filling the bottoms of the lakes with this carbon dioxide. They're called the killer lakes of Cameroon because in 1984, um, poisonous gas flow killed 37 people uh, from Lake Manown. Just two years later, Lake Nyos also overturned, releasing CO2, and it killed 1,700 people and 3,000 cattle. It was pretty. Uh, remarkable and devastating event. They've actually installed uh, pipes toward the bottom of the lake and those pipes bring forth water spewing up from the below because it's under pressure, so much pressure from that gas that's entering. Uh, this, this idea here is that it degasses slowly over time rather than in one big event, but I'm not sure if I'd bank on it or want to build a house on the side of this volcano. The next uh, hazard, tsunami. Of course, tsunami are the threat caused by underwater eruptions, eruptions of islands above water or underwater uh, where the pyroclastic flow can hit the water and, and move forth, or the island itself can blow, blow away. In the case of the Krakatoa volcano and the island of Krakatoa in Indonesia in 1883, uh, the eruption there was an ultra plenty eruption. It was a really big one. It blew about 200 meters off of the mountain and about another 200 meters below the mountain. Uh, and it sent a tsunami to Java and Sumatra that killed over 36,000 people. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that painting, The Scream, before by Edward Monk, but 
um, it's uh, depicting this event in 1883, a more modern version here. And then uh, Mount Onsen in Japan in 1792, uh, earthquake triggered a avalanche, creating a pyroclastic flow. And the pyroclastic flow hit the ocean and caused a tsunami that killed 15,000 people. This is a really major event. And you can see Mount Onsen pictured here in the bottom right, uh, extremely populated area for an active volcano. And you can see a mud flow coming off of the side of Lahar here, a Lahar danger, a pyroclastic flow danger, a tsunami danger. Again, Mount Unzen, kind of a dangerous place to live. Tephra is the name we give to the smallest of particles that come from volcanic eruptions, things like volcanic ash and dust. Of course, these can be ejected tens of kilometers into the atmosphere. You can see the size of the tephra from Mount St. Helens compared to a penny. Uh, the tephra blocking the skies from Mount Pinatubo in 1991, pictured there. It can accumulate on unreinforced building, buildings and make them collapse because basically it's like uh, snow, but the snow is made of rock. And so it's pretty dense and it gets pretty heavy uh, on roofs and rooftops and so forth. It can start fires. It can disrupt air traffic. A lot of times when volcanoes erupt, they direct air uh, air travel around it because they don't want uh, this tephra to get in the engines. It'll cause them to stall, and it has before. Uh, tephra can contaminate farmland and water supplies, and they don't. It obviously doesn't account for many of the initial deaths from volcanoes, but it can account for the vast majority of long-term deaths from a volcano because of the indirect problems it causes. Here's one such example. Mount Tambora in Indonesia, another Indonesian volcano. Uh, here it is uh, in, the, in the lower right here. Uh, Mount Tambora is in the southern part of Indonesia. When it erupted in 1815, uh, it was the most violent eruption in the last 200 years. Uh, it was a from a caldera. The tephra fallout damaged crops around the area and actually blocked out the sunlight so there was nothing to eat for people around. Some, a lot of people started dying from famine, and then there was a cholera outbreak, and many more people died. And uh, in all, almost 120,000 people were killed or, or died because of this. Most of the deaths occurred after in the long term from the eruption from the tephra. In fact, in 1816, they called it the year without a summer because the temperature was extremely cooler that year because of this eruption of Dent Mount Tambor in 1815. Lastly, today, atmospheric gas. SO2 is typically emitted from volcanoes as they erupt. And when it enters the atmosphere, and mixes in, it actually causes a cooling effect for the atmosphere. Mount, uh, or El Chichon is a good example of this, 1982. It was dormant for 550 years. And then after a month of earthquakes, it had a six hour Plinian uh, eruption. The column of, of material went 20 kilometers high in the atmosphere. There was a pyroclastic flow that overran several villages, killing a couple thousand people. Uh, even though it was a smaller eruption than Mount St. Helens, it released 100 times more SO2. And after circling the globe for 23 days, creating spectacular sunsets with the, with the dust, the dust and the SO2 lowered the global average temperature by about 0.2 degrees C, which is significant over the entire planet. And, of course, degrees C are several degrees Fahrenheit, you know, degrees C is less than degrees Fahrenheit in conversion. And El Nino followed that year. So El Nino are twice as likely after a major eruption in the tropics particularly, which when El Nino occurs, it changes weather patterns in the entire Northern Hemisphere. When Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, there was also a good amount of sulfur, uh, uh, sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere blocking sunlight. It actually caused an average global temperature to drop by a, a half a degree C in the area in the U, in the U.S. or worldwide. In the U.S., experienced a, a whole degree C drop in the temperature. Uh, so, SO2 is a 
pretty strong force when it comes to deep volcanic eruptions. Another one to mention here, Laki, Iceland in 1783. It was one of the largest lava eruptions in historic times, which was about, it, it when it erupted, it, it poured forth about one third the volume of the Mississippi River over 50 days. It, it released an enormous amount of gases. The haze of SO2 and fluorine killed about 20% of, or killed the, the, the majority of the livestock actually in the area. And as a result, a famine ensued and 20% of the people in Iceland died as a result of this. So it was a treacherous eruption. And last but not least, Mount Toba in Indonesia erupting 74,000 years ago. Uh, this was a major ultra plinian style eruption. We saw the magma pockets from previous uh, discussions we've had on volcanoes. It was massive. The amount of tephra and sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere must have been so great and probably for several years uh, causing a possible global cooling event uh, three to five degrees C. They, would, they might call this a volcanic winter where, you know, Lots of ash and gas get in the atmosphere, block the sunlight for several years, uh, causing uh, really, really cool temperatures. Um, archaeologists uh, also report that the human population went through a bottleneck during this time. It's pro probably likely to the eruption here on Mount Toba. One other different kind of eruption that is uh, when volcanoes release more CO2 than SO2. CO2, of course, in the atmosphere warms the atmosphere. And it's possible that major eruptions in the past, like those from the Deccan Plateau in India 65 million years ago, attributed to some of the warmer temperatures that we see on the Earth during that time. Temperatures were 10 degrees C warmer than today. And in addition to the fact that our our the positions of the continents were in the right spot for warmer temperatures, and the Earth's orbital cycles probably lined up. The sun may have went through a maximum, but also possible CO2 emissions from uh, the Deccan Plateau in central India. So that's volcanic hazards. Uh, what we would learn from lava flows, pyroclastic flows, mud flows, gas flows, water flows, and the little things that uh, come high into the atmosphere, such as uh, volcanic ash and dust, along with the atmospheric gas causing uh, climate issues. So that's volcanic.